I'm thrilled to be here today and talking about the future of teacher policy in California. We have a great panel of experts that, you know, I can, can say that because we put them together. Um, and I'm personally excited for this conversation. I think it's a much needed one in California. We've come a long way, as we've heard this morning, towards improving the provision of public education to our students. Um, and of course, we have a long way to go. But there's no resource more important than teachers to help make sure that all students are provided with a high quality education. So I'm going to start there, where I often begin these conversations about teacher policy with the recognition that teachers matter. Um, this is how I start almost all of my ed policy classes on teacher policy, how I start all my talks, just the thing that teachers matter. And this is something that um, recent work by Raj Chetty and his colleagues and Kirbo Jackson and others have empirically shown us. But this is something that teachers and school leaders and parents and kids have been telling us forever, right? This is not new news. Um, having a good teacher is the most important school-based resource for kids learning. Some of the findings from the research show that students assigned to a higher quality teacher for just one year are more likely to score higher on achievement tests, have fewer absences and suspensions, attend college and higher quality colleges, earn higher salaries later in life, and even participate at greater rates in retirement saving plans. And obviously these benefits compound for every year that you have a good teacher in the classroom. There's also a lot of research that shows us that low income minority students are disproportionately assigned to lower quality teachers as measured by test scores or measured by observations from on evaluation systems. So there's an equity issue here as well as a simple adequacy issue, if you want to go back to the terms from this morning. Um, so when I think about teacher policy and how a state like California should really be addressing teacher policy, I think it's important to remember that you have to address teacher policy and encourage quality teachers throughout their entire pipeline. So from before <coughs> they become teachers, when they're in high school or college or even before, into the pre-service programs, into the district schools and classrooms once they're hired and they're there, throughout their entire careers, and then even as they exit the profession, how do we think about that? Um, and so in this panel, we're gonna tackle just a few of the important policies that states like California should consider. And I will put a plug in um, for this, which is hot off the presses. This is the first day it's available, and I'll talk about that in a second. Oh, and Julie said they're all around the room and maybe out front, I think, um, and they're available on the PACE website. But as we were thinking about uh, teacher policy throughout the teacher pipeline, we realized there's actually a lot that we know about teacher quality, and there's a lot that we don't know, and there's a lot that states may not realize we know or that they could help us learn. And so kind of in that idea, Julie and I, along with PACE, decided to put together in May a teacher policy conference that brought together about 50 researchers, philanthropists, and um, experts in the field, practitioners, um, that talked about what do we know and what do we still need to know and what can California in specific as well as the nation do to help us learn more and to inform policy and practice so that we can make better policy to help have better teachers in every single classroom for every single kid. So we had five goals of this broad topic. We had five goals for this conference in May. One was to again identify the most pressing teacher related policy issues facing California and the nation. Second, to share what we needed to know and find out what we didn't already know. Um, third was to develop recommendations for research and how we could do this to help inform district administrators and policymakers, and to begin to generate partnerships between district and state policymakers, foundations who could help to fund and support the work, and researchers who could begin to do the work. Um, and one of the big important things we wanted to get out of this conference was to consider how research can really be used to help inform policy and practice. And that's part of what I think that we're going to talk about today. So coming out of this meeting, we ended up with 21 important topics for teacher policy research. <laughs> They're all there, and they map really well <laughs> to the pipeline that I showed earlier. The red are the ones that are the six that the researchers and folks in attendance that were kind of of utmost important for us to get to uh, as quickly as possible. And today, I'm just going to talk about two areas about, we, about which we know something, which are teacher evaluation and support and teacher tenure. And where California has room to grow. And so Mike, in his talk this morning, actually highlighted evaluation and support as one of the areas where we should be thinking about how to support teachers um, as we go through the pipeline. And tenure is very tied to that. And so I will talk about that today, and then we'll move on to some of these other things with the other panelists. So teacher evaluation, oops, teacher evaluation policy in California, as Mike mentioned, is uh, codified in the Stoll Bill, which was passed in 1971, and hasn't been substantially touched since then. Stoll requires an annual appraisal for probationary teachers, which are in their first two years in California, 
and biennial appraisal for all other teachers thereafter. This minimally includes including standards and techniques for assessing student progress, which are usually in California, the California uh, standards for the teaching profession. And if you look in a contract, which is where the evaluations are outlined, you see that almost every district just includes the standards and says, you're going to be evaluated on this. And when they do the evaluation, it's a checklist. And they say, check, 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 you did it. And then they have to have a written evaluation and a face-to-face -face meeting with the teacher, including sort of recommendations for how they could improve their practice. And that's what's written in the, in the law. So one of the things we've been learning over the last maybe seven to eight years in the research is that Stoll sort of reflects what was happening around the country, which is that most of these sort of status quo older evaluation systems um, suffer from a lot of problems. So one is that they're pretty infrequent. Right, you go in once for 20 minutes into a classroom, maybe once a year for the probationary or every other year for non-probationary teachers, and you don't get a lot of feedback. Um, maybe you get this checklist, you're asked to sign it and say you got it. Um, and there's, there's not a lot of sort of focus to this about how I could really be improving my practice. What can I use? So it doesn't seem very helpful, and it wasn't really tied to anything. It was inconsequential. It didn't really matter. Teachers reported from all over the country. It didn't really matter for whether or not they were gonna get tenure or not, if they were going to have any sort of assistance in PD later in their careers. It just didn't seem to be doing much for them. Um, most of these systems only had two or maybe three even pass or no pass options, and so they weren't really getting much at all besides like you're fine or you're not, and you meet or you don't meet standards. Um, so teachers would tell us and principals would tell people that they didn't really feel these were very valid or reliable, they didn't really know what they were measuring, and they didn't really capture the complexity of teaching, right? Teaching is not a simple pass, no pass occupation. Teaching is a very complex thing you do in the classroom to make sure you're really achieving what you want to achieve with helping to help your students learn. So if the intent behind evaluation and support policies is to, one, provide teachers and principals with information about how they're doing and where they could improve and where they're doing well and where they could support other teachers in doing well, um, help them improve their practice and maybe hold them accountable for improvement in their practice. The Stoll system, like many others that were around the country at the time, wasn't particularly doing this. So given the kind of growing research that we had about this and many federal policies that were attempting to incentivize improvements in teacher evaluation and support systems, most of the states around the country implemented multiple measure teacher evaluation and support systems. In fact, a recent study says that about 46 out of the 50 states did implement some version of teacher evaluation reform. Um, and this idea was to really address the concerns of the old programs. And so they're supposed to be more frequent. So on average, there were two formal observations a year and two and a half informal observations a year. Um, they are differentiated. There were three to five ratings. And the, although still, all this work has been showing us that most of teachers are still reporting satisfactory, even, even in these new systems. Um, observations are based on detailed standards-based protocols like the Danielson Protocol or the National Board Professional Teaching Standards Protocols, and observers are supposed to be trained on how to look at teacher practice using these protocols and then provide very structured, detailed feedback in conferences. Um, in many states, they're consequential and they're tied to outcome decisions like tenure. Um, teachers have reported feeling and principals that some of these, are, these measures are actually more valid and more reliable whether or not they're VANs, which are sort of based on student test scores or other similar student achievement outcomes, or more often these observations that are really according to a rubric that are, the teachers understand and the principals have been trained on. Um, and they consider the complexity. So these measures not only look at student achievement, but also practice in the classroom, also things like contributions to professional environment. There's oftentimes student or teacher surveys, peer surveys about teaching practice. So they're really trying to get more at the whole picture of a teacher instead of just the minimum kind of requirements. Um, now this is the ideal of the MMT ESs and not necessarily being accomplished in every state. So we're learning now about them. These are kind of relatively new reforms and there are some studies that have just been coming out in the last few years to tell us that these are working. And MMT ES appear to improve student achievement and teacher retention of the kinds of teachers we want when they are full-fledged systems. Right, when they are implemented well, we find that like in Cincinnati, which is one of the oldest systems in the country, um, teachers were more likely to improve when they went through these systems of, of evaluation and support. Similarly, in Chicago, this occurred. And again, these are tied to coaching, tied to support, um, tied to professional development that are targeted at the needs that are identified in the systems of evaluation. In DC, the impact system, which has gotten a lot of press, has been shown to improve 
uh, student achievement for the teachers who are going through the program. Um, and this is again tied to high level consequences. So if you don't do well in your evaluation under impact, you can be dismissed if you don't improve over time. Um, in addition, we find in Chicago and DC that low performing teachers who go through the MMTSs are more likely to exit their schools and districts than are the higher performing teachers. And we're doing some work, Julie and I, and some of our students in L Unified, and we find some similar results in terms of retention of high quality teachers there. And of course, I can't make it too clear that across all these systems, we know you have to worry about implementation, right? You have to get the buy-in of the teachers. You have to work with the labor partners. You have to do a lot of stuff to kind of understand the context of your district and your schools. And Julie Kopik, who's in the room, has some really nice work, work out on that in California. So that kind of brings us to teacher tenure policy. These are kind of some of the consequences and some of the uh, consequential labor actions that we can think about happening as a result if we have good performance understanding of how our teachers are doing in our classrooms. So teacher tenure policy in California is dictated in the Ed Code, and teachers serve two-year probationary period in California, have to serve two consecutive years in the same district, and you have to be offered reemployment by March of the second year. And once that happens, you become a permanent teacher and may only be dismissed for valid reasons, and you can look in the Ed Code for those valid reasons. Some of them are um, more helpful than others. <laughs> Performance does not have to be taken into account in California. So California is an atypical system. We are on the low end. Only a few states have a two-year probationary period. Most states are more three to five years. Um, and California is one of the few states that hasn't undergone some conversation around this. And of course, we had the Regara um, lawsuit, which did not, uh, was not upheld in the, in the courts. So that's kind of where our commission has been in here. We've had some um, policies from, uh, in the legislature discussed, but none passed. So prior to 2009, no state's legislation on tenure required districts to take performance into account in making tenure decisions. But by this year and last year, 16 states mandated that tenure could not be granted without evidence of effectiveness. And seven states actually said, if you're no longer effective even after you get tenure, we can remove your tenure protections. And three states actually have eliminated tenure overall. So there's a lot of activity around the state, around the country on tenure. <coughs> Why would we do this? So proponents argue that these tenure laws are actually very good, right? So they protect teachers from unreasonable job requirements, censure, and arbitrary dismissal, which has been very important, especially in the last few months. Um, and job security can be considered part of an overall compensation. So one of the ways to think about this is a teacher is choosing a job compared to other jobs, and they choose a job based on their compensation in terms of salary and benefits, but also on other things that are maybe a little less tangible, like job security, right? And so if we take away tenure, maybe we're taking away part of a teacher's compensation, and they may be less inclined to come into teaching or to stay in teaching. So opponents, though, of these tenure systems argue that tenure is harmful for schools and kids because it makes it so hard to fire an ineffective teacher once they have tenure, given just the, the resources that would be required to do that in the expense. And this is one of the big things in the Vergara case. So the idea behind reform is kind of this simplistic theory of action at the bottom, We you would make tenure harder to obtain, and this gives administrators more flexibility around human capital management, and then they would be able to remove ineffective teachers more efficiently, and then improve the quality of the workforce. It's hard to study this, right, because the, the reforms have been very, very recent. But what we do know from some simulation studies are that lessening tenure protections would likely lead to gains in productivity in terms of teacher and student achievement. Um, in New York, there has been an interesting reform taking place in New York City, and we find that teachers who had probationary time extended due to performance concerns, so principals were able to say, we just don't think you're ready for tenure yet, you need to take another year, they were more likely to voluntarily exit. Um, but teachers do view tenure as part of their compensation, so reforms need to be made with some thought and care. So teacher salaries are associated with length of probationary period, so the longer you have a probationary period, the more you have to pay your teachers. This is from a national data set. Um, we know that from a couple of the simulations that denying tenure to teachers would likely require you to raise their salaries, right? You're going to trade off compensation. And then some work that I'm doing in Louisiana now shows that when you remove tenure protections entirely, which they did in Louisiana, um, and you tie retention to performance, it does increase teacher exit along the distribution of teacher experience. So you're going to lose some teachers, and especially your really senior teachers who are going to go retire and say, I don't need this, right? So you need to think about, if you want to put these reforms into place, what that's going to look like. So I've been told I have a minute left, which is perfect. Um, so I'm going to bring us back to this, because this is going to be the framing for the rest of the panel. So I just talked about sort of one of the policies about exiting the profession and one of the policies about sort of supporting teachers throughout their careers. And Corey's going to talk about a couple more of these, and then I'm looking forward to the panel conversation that's going to open up even more of these ideas. <laughs>